Welcome to our continuing 2021 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for FIRST Healthcare Compliance. At FIRST Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business, a hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility, and we help manage every aspect of a compliance program, and our training library provides hundreds of modules that are easy to assign and track. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Rachel V. Rose, JD, MBA, Principal with Rachel V. Rose, Attorney at Law, PLLC, Houston, Texas, with us today. Ms. Rose has a unique background, having worked in many different facets of healthcare, securities, and international law and business throughout her career. Her practice focuses on a variety of cybersecurity, health law, health care, and securities law issues related to industry compliance and transactional work, as well as representing, representing plaintiffs in Dodd-Frank, False Claims Act whistleblower claims, which remain under seal. Ms. Rose holds an MBA with minors in healthcare and entrepreneurship from Vanderbilt University and a, and a law degree from Stetson University College of Law, where she graduated with various honors, included, including the National Scribes Award and the William F. Blues Pro Bono Service Award. Ms. Rose is licensed in Texas. Currently, she is the chair of the Federal Bar Association's Government Relations Committee and the co-editor of the American Health Lawyers Association's Enterprise Risk Management Handbook for Healthcare Entities, second edition, as well as a co-author of the books, The ABCs of ACOs and What Are International Business Considerations. She has been named consecutively to the Texas Bar College the National Women Trial Lawyers Association's Top 25 and Houstonia Magazine's Top Lawyers for Healthcare. Ms. Rose is an affiliated member of the Baylor College Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy, where she teaches bioethics. Before we begin, I would like to mention at First Healthcare Compliance, we strive to serve as a trusted resource for compliance professionals and every month, we celebrate their hard work and dedication with our Compliance Super Ninja recognition. Our team is turning the spotlight on Super Ninja Jean Bassford, Human Resources Generalist at Maine Nephrology Associates, Associates PA. Jean says, I love working for a medical practice with such caring staff, both clinical and non-clinical. We all work hard to make things run as smoothly as possible so our providers can give the best possible care to our patients. Congratulations, Jean. Our team is honored to have the privilege of working with you. A copy of the slides is available for download on the control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the, into the question box on your control panel during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM and PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the broadcast. Your PACOM certificate will come directly to pay, will, will come directly from PACOM, and your PMI certificate will come from our email. There is no need to request either one. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. So Rachel, a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Catherine, and a very warm thank you back to you for having me again as a guest with First Healthcare Compliance. It's always my honor and my privilege to collaborate with you and Julie and the rest of your team. Thank you. Okay, so shall we begin? We shall. All right. Well, as everyone can tell by the picture on the screen, we are here to celebrate the 20th 
25th anniversary of HIPAA. And who knew in 1996 that HIPAA would evolve into the law that it has become today? Before we begin, it's important to note that the information presented is not meant to constitute legal advice. If you have a specific situation, then you need to consult your attorney. The information presented is current as of the date of the original recording of the presentation. And given the dynamic nature of the topic, participants are encouraged to check the relevant government websites for the most recent information. So for those of you who have heard me present before, I always begin with some noteworthy news. And then we're gonna transition into a recap of the past 25 years, then delve into the 21st Century Cures Act and how that integrates into HIPAA's evolution. From there, we'll go into some DOJ enforcement actions, which include both civil and criminal actions. Then we'll go into risk mitigation in the era of ransomware. And finally conclude with some takeaways and open the floor to questions. So what are some noteworthy news items? Well, first and foremost, the United States Department of Justice issued remarks as it normally does regarding the Civil Division's 2021 priorities. And these particular statements were made in February of 2021. However, as the year has evolved and in light of some of our other noteworthy news items, these are still very germane and very important. First and foremost, the GOJ recognizes that providers are increasingly relying on electronic records to improve treatment outcomes for patients. While electronic software is intended to reduce errors and improve the delivery of care, the transition to a digital format has also introduced new opportunities for fraud and abuse. Some of those we'll get into later on down the line when I talk about some of the past civil and criminal actions and then integrate that into the False Claims Act, which is one of the government's primary tools to thwart fraud and abuse, especially in the healthcare sector. Cybersecurity generally is also a significant area of focus for the DOJ. Notably, these two areas, both electronic health records and telemedicine, reflect the increasing importance of technology to the healthcare system. And the United States' growing reliance on technology is not limited to the healthcare arena. However, as many of us who have been in the healthcare arena appreciate, it is one of the top targets for cyber criminals as well as fraud. An example that was given was cybersecurity related fraud may be another area where we could see enhanced False Claims Act activity. And with the growing threat of cyber attacks, federal agencies are relying heavily on robust cybersecurity protections to safeguard our vital governmental data and information. So to the extent that the government pays for systems or services that purport to comply with required cybersecurity standards but fail to do so, it is not difficult to imagine a situation where False Claims Act liability may arise. And a couple of areas where this has a history of coming into play is through the False Claims Act and the Truth and Negotiations Act, also known as TINA, which is incorporated into a government procurement situation. So that could be an area where you may see False Claims Act liability. Another area which we have seen is 
falsifying that a particular EHR meets the requisite standards that were set forth in what I call the program formerly known as Meaningful Use and still continue to be required today. So I have examples of those types of cases later on and that's something that all providers and business associates, subcontractors, as well as those directly contracting with the federal government should be very aware of. Now on May 12th of 2021, the president issued an executive order and specifically the executive order indicated that within 60 days of the date of the order, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, which is referred to as OBM, in consultation with the Secretary of Defense and other agency leaders and cabinet members, shall review the federal acquisition regulation known as FAR and the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, contract requirements and language for contracting with IT and OT service providers and recommend updates to such requirements and language to the FAR Council and other appropriate agencies. Now, FAR is important because in government contracting, it is very germane to attestations, which can lead to a contract with the federal government for payment. And as was noted in the previous slide, a False Claims Act liability can and does arise for false and fraudulent statements, which are provided to the United States government through various phases. First, in the acquisition or the RFP phase. Second, when the contract is signed. And then lastly, for additional claim submissions, or submissions for payment on invoices. So this is not limited to healthcare by any means. However, healthcare can be involved in these types of scenarios. So before I begin with HIPAA's 21st years, I would like to take you back in time to 1996. And ironically, it is not only the year that I happen to be working on the Hill when HIPAA passed, but there were a lot of very lively characters in both the House side and the Senate side. And what individuals may not know is that HIPAA was actually enacted to improve the portability of health insurance coverage so that employees retained health insurance coverage between jobs. And it's also known as the Kennedy Cast Bomb Law. And it's known as that because it was Senator Kennedy and Senator Kassbaum who actually co-sponsored the bill and came up with what is known as COBRA. As we know, HIPAA extends far beyond just health insurance portability and coverage. It also expanded the ability of the DOJ to conduct healthcare fraud investigations. Additionally, we do have probably the most common components of HIPAA, which were addressed when HIPAA passed. However, as we know, subsequent regulations such as the privacy rule and the security rule eventually were promulgated. So basically it was to overall improve the number of insured and enable individuals to transfer their health insurance from job to job or remain covered in between a job situation. Another item was to combat fraud, waste, and abuse in the health insurance and health care delivery. And finally, it also contained passages to promote the use of medical savings accounts by introducing tax breaks 
providing coverage for employees with pre-existing medical conditions and simplifying the administration of health insurance. Eventually, the High Tech Act was passed not only on the heels of HIPAA, but on the security rule in order to encourage healthcare industry participants to computerize patients' medical records. So that's the overall history of HIPAA and how it evolved 25 years ago. Now, who is under the legal umbrella of HIPAA? Well, first, we have three main buckets, and I give this in every presentation, A, because there are individuals with varying degrees of experience in healthcare, and B, to make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of the definitions that will be used throughout the rest of the presentation. So the first prong is a covered entity, and there are three main buckets associated with that. You have providers, health plans, and healthcare clearinghouses. From there, covered entities contract with business associates. And between a covered entity and a business associate, not only is there an agreement for a certain type of service, for example, but also that requirement that a business associate agreement be put in place between the covered entity and the business associate. What's important to note about the business associate agreement is that it, from my perspective, primarily does three things. First, both entities give reasonable assurances that they are compliant with HIPAA and the High Tech Act and all the relevant laws and regulations, meaning they have the requisite technical, administrative, and physical safeguards in place. Second, there's a breach notification requirement that needs to be expressly stated and it's very helpful to include on both parties because as we know the sophistication of cyber attackers a breach can originate at a covered entity and then affect a business associate or vice versa and so it's important to note what the time frame is for notifying the other entity of a reportable breach. And lastly, it defines what the covered entity, or if it's written by different agreement in the language of the business associate agreement, who is going to contact the government agency, who is going to contact the patients. Normally it defaults to the covered entity. However, contractually an entity or a person can in fact designate who would do that. Finally, we have business associates contracting with subcontractors. And again, a business associate agreement is needed between a business associate and a subcontractor. So I always put up an example of a state law, and since I live and practice in Texas, I'm going to utilize Texas House Bill 300, which became law in September of 2012. One key difference, if we look here in the definitions, is Texas has one definition of a covered entity, and that's anyone or any person who creates, receives, maintains, or transmits protected health information. So not only does it encompass the three buckets that we have up above under federal HIPAA, it is any person. It's also notable that the business associate agreement and all of the other aspects of the security rule and the privacy rule are incorporated into the Texas House bill. There is a separate breach notification rule under state law in Texas, as is the case with every other state in the country. So what you're seeing here is nothing new. Now the Federal Trade Commission also has jurisdiction over HIPAA, and it really fills the gap 
for anyone who creates, receives, maintains, or transmits PHI may have a breach reporting obligation if there is a breach of electronic protected health information. But the Federal Trade Commission can also fine various covered entities and we've seen that in the past, stemming back at least to 2009, with entities such as CVS and Rite Aid, and then later on, Henry Sheen Dental, because of the impact on consumer rights and consumer protection. So that's where the Federal Trade Commission may come into play as well. So we know HIPAA was passed on and signed into law on August. 21st of 1996. And one of the primary drivers, as we've already discussed, was the need for a consistent framework for transactions and other administrative items, as well as increased tools for fraud and abuse in healthcare. And then the healthcare or medical savings accounts and the ability for coverage to continue in the event of a job change or a lapse in coverage. In 2002, the what I call the final privacy rule came out. And I say that because the initial privacy rule was published in the Federal Register in December of 2000. And another privacy rule was published in January of 2001. In 2003, we see the security rule published in the Federal Register with an effective date of 2005. So then we have a nice four year period until we see the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health, known as the High Tech Act which was part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 come into play. And there we really saw these interim rules and proposed rules stem from the High Tech Act, including a more robust breach notification rule with four different types of tiers. And HIPAA, many may not realize, does have criminal penalties, which may be associated with it. From there, we have some broadening, so to speak, even though it was always there in the privacy rule, but it was more of the express inclusion of business associates and subcontractors who could also be held accountable and liable for a breach of PHI. Now, 2013 is the golden year, so to speak, for the HIPAA final omnibus rule. And that's when a lot of individuals and organizations really focused on HIPAA. And it's because everything that we saw between 2009 and the publication in the Federal Register, and that site 78 Federal Register 5566, and that's January 25th of 2013. That is the omnibus rule. Basically, everything that was proposed in this four year period, a lot of it came into being, including that express liability for business associates and subcontractors. Now, Another important note is that a couple of other laws are expressly referenced in the omnibus rule, including the Genetic Information Non-Disclosure Act, as well as an emphasis on laboratories. And the lab provisions of the omnibus rule were effective later and had a compliance date much later than September 23rd of 2013. But for those of you who live in Texas or in parts of Florida, for example, there are labs that you can go to called Any Lab Test Now, and you can ask for your blood work to be ordered. You don't need a physician order in order to get 
tests. So that was definitely a change. And then for employers who were doing drug testing, for example, there were nuances that had to be worked out between the labs as well as to who could get the tests back and the language change because, again, the individual could have access under normal circumstances to their own results directly from the lab. So HIPAA and the High Tech Act, here I always tell my clients to think of HIPAA and the High Tech Act like a Reese's peanut butter cup. And by that, I mean you have to think of the two of them together. So one thing the High Tech Act did was really emphasize that a breach is generally an impermissible use or disclosure under the privacy rule that compromises the security or privacy of protected health information. Stated another way from a compliance or risk mitigation standpoint, one always wants to have as the primary objective ensuring that the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the data is protected. This provision also requires covered entities to notify affected individuals, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and in the event of a breach involving 500 or more individuals, the media of a breach of unsecured PHI. Now, most notifications must be provided without unreasonable delay and no later than 60 days following the discovery of a breach. Now, an important note on that part is that you have to have all of the other facets in play if it's been determined that there is a reportable breach automatically don't wait until that 60 day to tell the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the patients as well as the media. That needs to be uh, out and done before that time. Notifications of smaller breaches affecting fewer than 500 individuals may be submitted to HHS annually. And normally HHS will advise when that date is. And then finally, the breach notification rule also requires business associates to notify the covered entity of breaches at or by the business associate. And it's important to note that there are three exceptions to a breach. One exception is, for example, if you have an unintended email that's sent internally to Sally Smith in one department instead of Sally Smith in another department. As long as Sally Smith A notifies the sender and indicate that she is deleting it, then that would not be an issue. The key is to delete and not utilize the PHI. Another example is similar whereby someone could be part of an organization and that could be an accountable care organization for example the same steps should be taken lastly a type of transmission that would not be deemed a reportable breach is when bills go out via mail and they are returned or a, an encrypted email is sent and it is not opened you know that in good faith, it is unlikely that that PHI was ever viewed. So if you get the return to sender without any opening, then you know that it's most likely not a reportable breach. Now, the High Tech Act and HR 7898, this one may have slipped past some of you. It was kind of sneaky. It was signed into law on January 5th of 2021, and it specifically addresses the recognition of security practices and amends the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act by adding section 13412. Additionally, what it does is to correct section 3022B of the Public Health Service Act 
and add that it should take effect as if included in the enactment of the 21st Century Cures Act, which was enacted on December the 13th of 2016. Now, what's important about these two items are these key terms here. Well, first and foremost, the fundamental aspect is what is in the blue provision. And that is if you are utilizing the NIST or the National Institute of Standards and Technology parameters or requirements, that gives in essence another safe harbor. And I say that because HHS, whenever they're evaluating a breach, the first thing they do is ask for your past risk analyses to see if you've addressed any gaps, to see what's been updated. And whenever I do risk analyses, and I've done them for over close to a decade now, Basically, I have always looked first and foremost at the security rule, then I crosswalk that to the NIST standards, and then a lot of my clients have an international connection, so I also use ISO standards, which is equally important. And lastly, I might look to other relevant standards as well. But basically what it does is recognize security practices can help you and your organization in a number of ways. First, as I noted, in the event of a government investigation. Secondly, in doing that, the secretary shall consider whether the covered entity or business associate has adequately demonstrated that it had, for not less than the previous 12 months, recognize security practices, and again, our term is down here, in place that may mitigate fines, result in an early audit termination, and mitigate remedies. Lastly, no liability for non-participation. It's not required, but it is certainly encouraged, and not only, again, for the government investigation and the potential penalties that can ensue, but also from a contractual standpoint, a lot of insurance companies are looking at this before they renew or initially insure someone. A lot of banks are asking for some form of recognized security practice or assurance in terms of a line of credit because that's something that could really harm a business in the event of a cyber attack. And lastly, as we've seen over the last several years, class actions. Class actions are very costly, and if you can show that yes, you had a duty and there was a cyber attack, but that you met every single prong and have every technical, administrative, and physical safeguard in place that you could, that's gonna mitigate your damages that you may be held accountable for in the event of any lawsuit, but since class actions are, are particularly large and costly, it could really help in that arena as well. So this is very important in terms of individuals' right of access to health records. Well, it's known as the Ciox case, but it's a provision in the privacy rule and the security rule. And what do I mean by that? Well, under the privacy rule, you have to give a patient a right of access to their protected health information with the exception of psychotherapy notes and uh, a couple of other items. But basically, the, in PSYOX, specific provisions within 45 CFR, section 164.524, that cover the individual's access to protected health information was challenged. And on January 23rd of 2020, the federal court vacated the third party directive within the individual right of access insofar as it expanded the High Tech Act's third party directive 
beyond requests for a copy of an electronic health record with respect to protected health information of an individual in an electronic format. And this was important for a couple of items. A, the fee limitation will only apply to the individual's request for access to their own records and does not apply to an individual's request to transmit records to a third party. So one issue here is the cost. The second is the electronic format. And the last part is the individual's request for their records to go to them, or if you are the appropriate representative of the patient, that's different than a third party such as a law firm, for example. PsyOx is in fact the case that I mentioned on the previous slide, and it actually, as a result, changed a portion of the final omnibus rule. And we already know what was challenged in the federal court, so we're not going to rehash that. But again, the right of individuals to access their own records and the fee limitations that apply when exercising this right are undisturbed and remain in effect. OCR will continue to enforce the right of access provisions that are not restricted by the court order. Now, this is very important because in, very recently, I believe in the end of May of 2021, HHS OCR announced its 19th enforcement action of their initiative on an individual's right to access. And we've seen the fees or penalties range for those types of violations by covered entities from $5,000 was the latest one, but some of those actually climbed up into the millions. So again, it just depends on the size and the scope of the issue, but it's really unfortunate, typically under federal HIPAA, and I'll give you a preview as to HIPAA's next 25 years, but currently under federal HIPAA, an entity has 30 days to give a patient their protected health information records. However, that may be extended another 60 days, but you have to give the patient notice and some other items need to be met. But another part of that that is equally as important is that a lot of these individuals had to get lawyers involved. So looking ahead, the privacy rule is under reconstruction, I will call it. Uh, the notice and comment period for proposed changes closed at the beginning of May 2021. And one of the items that was looked into was providing individuals their medical records sooner. Now, I would encourage individuals to look at your state's law because oftentimes states have a much shorter time frame, ranging typically from five to 14 to 21 to 30 days. But most common that I have seen is 14 days. So it's nothing to blow off. And it's something that if you are a covered entity or if you are a business associate that does in fact handle the providing patients their medical records, make sure that you're meeting the requirements of both the state and the current HIPAA requirements, but also staying abreast of what is coming down the pike. Now, I mentioned that these proposed changes were underway. And this was at the end of 2020. Again, they extended the comment period, which closed at the beginning of May, 2021. But basically HHS published the proposed changes to the privacy rule. And these changes center around the following, increasing an individual's rights and access to his or her protected health information, expanding information sharing for purposes of care coordination, providing disclosure flexibility in select situations such as opioid overdose and 
COVID-19. And in fact, for those of you who are intimately familiar with HIPAA, there really already is a, an ability to share information with uh, certain family and friends in a treatment setting. The caveats that I always tell people are A, make sure that the person you're telling is not prohibited from getting that information and that should be identified on the HIPAA authorization. But if it's an emergent situation, whoever's there might not have capacity to give that information at the time. But the other part is you need to be aware with opioids that SAMHSA may also apply depending on the type of facility that is involved. So SAMHSA is the government agency, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and they're over what's known as Part 2. So 42 CFR Part 2, and that's really what governs the substance abuse and mental health types of records and treatment. Ironically, SAMHSA in Part 2 stems back to the mid-1970s and was promulgated in response to the 1960s drug culture. So it actually predates HIPAA by 20 years. Finally, reducing administrative burdens on covered entities. And a key role in this last objective is that of the 21st Century Cures Act, which we'll get to momentarily. So the privacy rule proposal basically includes HIPAA, the High Tech Act, and the 21st Century Cures Act. And as we look ahead, here are some key areas to focus on. Reinforcing an individual's right to access his or her own PHI, including ePHI, improving the sharing of information for purposes of care coordination, facilitating greater family and caregiver involvement through appropriate disclosures during crises situations such as COVID and the opioid epidemic, and reducing administrative burdens on providers. Now, there is a balance in this administrative burden, and so there's going to be a ramp-up period, so you just need to prepare for that. And the best way to get everyone in your office, as well as your business associates on the same page where it's relevant, is to make sure you're updating your policies and procedures and doing up-to-date training. So the security rule requires appropriate technical, administrative, and physical safeguards to ensure the confidentiality integrity and security, as well as the availability of electronic protected health information. And the security rule is primarily located at 45 CFR part 160 and subparts A and C of part 164. Now, TAP are the areas in the security rule which should be included in every single risk analysis or risk assessment that an organization does. Technical safeguards means technology. It could be firewalls. It could be antivirus software, for example, as well as the policies and procedures for its use that protect electronic protected health information and control access to it. Administrative safeguards are everything from policies and procedures to the maintenance of security measures and some other back conduct to manage the workforce, such as conducting background checks, for example. Physical safeguards are things such as badge access and having a code access, having a receptionist so that when there are non-employees on site, people can sign in and you can keep track of them so that you know whether or not someone outside of an employee or workforce member such as an independent contractor has already been accounted for. 
So assessing risk, risk can be defined as probability times severity. So whenever I do a risk assessment for an organization, that's always how I view compliance with any of the individual line items. What's the probability of this happening and what's the severity if it does happen? And there's a reasonableness standard that comes into play, but if you're an organization, for example, with offices in Nebraska and Texas and Florida, what is a high risk issue such as a snow and ice storm in Nebraska is not gonna be an, as much of an issue in Florida. Conversely, hurricanes are something that is a a great issue in Florida and Texas, for example, versus Nebraska really doesn't get hurricanes. So you have to balance and answer each question individually. So HHS advocates building a culture of compliance, and this does not only apply to HIPAA, it also applies to your fraud, waste, and abuse policies and procedures, as well as billing and coding. So that's always something to include in all training. Policies plus processes plus technical administrative and physical safeguards plus tracking equals visible demonstrable evidence. And if we think back to the slide on House Resolution 7898, which gave us that additional safe harbor with the NIST standards, making sure that you do your risk assessments annually and correlating it to those NIST standards, that will give you visible demonstrable evidence and that is exactly what all government agencies look at. VDE helps with mitigating risk, minimizing the exploitation of vulnerabilities and assisting a person to achieve its commitment to compliance. And that should not be IT apostrophe S, it should just be ITS. And a person under the Supreme Court can be an individual human or it can be a corporation. So that's why I use that term throughout. So we mentioned HIPAA's evolution and we know why it came about. But moving forward and looking at the last couple of years as a building block, what can we glean? Well, first and foremost, on April 21st of 2020, CMS announced the interoperability and patient access final rule, which includes policies that impact a variety of stakeholders. Recognizing that hospitals, including psychiatric hospitals and critical access hospitals, are on the front lines of the COVID-19 public health emergency, CMS is extending the implementation timeline for the admission, discharge, and transfer notifications for conditions of participation by an additional six months. And I put this up here because in retrospect, this is something that you always need to be on top of, especially during any emergency. And coming from Texas, we've seen emergencies with storms such as Hurricane Harvey. And a lot of what the nation is seeing on a macro scale with these different announcements that CMS makes, that's exactly what happens on a micro scale if there, for example, is a hurricane or severe flooding. So that's just something to be very, very conscientious of. Next, information blocking. And this is a huge, huge area to hone in on because it relates back to what we saw with PSYOX. It relates back to the proposed changes for the final, final privacy rule, which again, if you think back to the slide, incorporates the HIPAA, High Tech Act, and 21st Century Cures Act. Now, information blocking, as well as the exceptions, and there are eight of them, are found in Section 4004. There are also 
two final rules, which were published in May of 2020, which relate to the 21st Century Cures Act. The first is known as the ONC final rule, and the second is known as the CMS final rule. Importantly, information blocking, although it's referenced eight times in the CMS final rule, what we're seeing here stems from the ONC final rule. So again, just something to be very conscious of and very aware of. Information blocking is a practice by a health IT developer of certified health information networks, health information exchanges, or healthcare provider that, except as required by law or specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, as reasonable and necessary activities, are likely to interfere with access, exchange, or use of electronic health information. Now, notice under traditional HIPAA, we use the term electronic protected health information. So it's important to appreciate that electronic health information does in fact include electronic protected health information. So practices that are likely to constitute information blocking include these three items. First, practices that restrict authorized access, exchange, or use under applicable state or federal law of such information for treatment and other permitted purposes under said applicable law, including transitions between certified health information technologies. Implementing health IT in non-standard ways that are likely to substantially increase the complexity or burden of accessing, exchanging, or using EHI. And finally, implementing health IT in ways that are likely to A, restrict the access, exchange, or use of EHI with respect to exporting complete information sets or in transitioning between health IT systems or lead to fraud, waste, or abuse or impede innovations and advancements in health information access, exchange, and use, including care delivery enabled by health IT. Now, information blocking exceptions. Two general categories exist. One includes exceptions that involve procedures for fulfilling requests to access, exchange, or use EHI. And second, not fulfilling requests to access, exchange, or use EHI. Why is this important? It's absolutely paramount because if someone, some patient says, I want you to transfer my medical record to my TikTok app, that is not secure. Moreover, whatever vulnerabilities may be on that TikTok app, that could then be transmitted back to the practice and or that covered entity's business associate. And the harm that could be done outweighs the benefit to the individual patient of getting their EHI medical record on an app that is known not to be secure. So that's something just to be aware of. So the category one exceptions include preventing harm, privacy, security, infeasibility, and health IT performance. The second is the content and manner exception, fees, again, think back to SIOX, and the licensing exception. So here, we're going to now segue into DOJ civil and criminal enforcement. And I'm going to take us to July 31st of 2019, where Cisco Systems, entered into a settlement with the United States Department of Justice for $8.6 million to settle allegations that it sold video surveillance equipment to federal and state government agencies 
knowing that the equipment was susceptible to cyber attack. Almost two years after the suit was filed, the suit actually was filed in 2011. So this is a reminder that if you are considering being a whistleblower in a False Claims Act case, that you need to appreciate that it is a marathon and definitely not a sprint. So in mid-2013, this was two years after the suit was filed, and Cisco more likely did not, did not know about the False Claims Act suit existence because that is a type of case that is filed under seal for a minimum of 60 days for the statute, but oftentimes the government, in order to conduct a thorough investigation, does request extensions of the seal so no one would know about who brought the case or if a case exists necessarily until the government decides to do discovery. And even then, if certain types of subpoenas are issued, it doesn't necessarily connote that it is in response to a False Claims Act action. Multiple security vulnerabilities in versions of Cisco Video Surveillance Manager prior to 7.0.0, which may allow an attacker to gain full administrative privileges on the system, including the ability to alter camera feeds. Next, notable because the case was filed again in 2011, it was believed to be the first FCA case based on cybersecurity fraud upon a government agency. However, even though that's what the press release said, I would beg to differ on that because of the Oracle PeopleSoft settlement in 2006, which actually was for a lot more money, but also involved some cyber deficiencies. Now, as it relates to healthcare, and going back to one of our first slides, electronic health record vendors have been the defendants in various False Claims Act cases. Some notable ones include the eClinical Works case, Greenway Health, and Informed Diagnostics. And these total more than $275 million. There's also an interesting settlement for high tech and HIPAA noncompliance, and that is the Coffee Health System case out of Kansas. The basis for cases in 2011, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services established the Medicare and Medicaid EHR incentive program to encourage clinicians, eligible hospitals, and critical access hospitals to adopt, implement, upgrade, and demonstrate meaningful use of certified EHR technology. Independent certification bodies are used to review and determine if the EHR system submitted by the EHR vendor meets certain requirements. Now, a lot of you probably attested to those meaningful use requirements, and in April of 2018, CMS changed the name, as I call it, the program formerly known as Meaningful Use, to the EHR Incentive Program to Promoting Interoperability Programs, or PI. The impact of this change is to move the programs beyond the existing requirements of meaningful use, to a new phase of EHR measurement with an increased focus on interoperability and improving patient access to health information. PI requirements include certifications, certification criteria, and use parameters. Now, as an incentive for EHR to continue, the government scrutiny on entities receiving incentive payments does as well. So if you're attesting to something, that's actually how Coffee Health System got into trouble. It had to do with their attestation that they were meeting their own requirements, not unlike eClinical Works and Greenway, who were actual the EHR vendors who submitted the false statements to the government program and said, oh, we meet all the parameters and 
the environment is safe. The reason that they were targeted and not the individual physicians and hospitals, for example, is because the physicians, hospitals, et cetera, relied upon eClinical Works being an approved EHR system. So this, again, can go two ways in terms of potential liability. eClinical Works settled in May of 2017 for $155 million along with a five-year corporate integrity agreement. The DOJ's complaint in intervention alleged that eClinical Works conduct caused the submission of false claims and false statements to the government by alleging that the software was certified and as a result, their customers received incentive payments. The coffee case that I mentioned settled for a much lower amount, but it's also a critical access hospital. Coffee falsely attested that it had conducted and or reviewed security risk analyses in accordance with requirements under a federal incentive program for the reporting periods of 2012 and 2013. Submission of false and fraudulent claims under the EHR incentive program. So those were the actual meaningful use attestations. And basically, the DOJ said that government program beneficiaries expect that providers ensure the accuracy and security of their electronic health records. Now, here is a criminal situation, and this involves Gwinnett Medical Center. And on June 8th of 2021, there was an indictment which was filed in federal court in the Northern District of Georgia. Specifically, a former employee of GMC who ran a network security company that offered services for the healthcare industry was charged with the following, stealing protected health information, disrupting the hospital's ASCOM phone system, accessing Lexmark printers and Hologic R2 digitizers, 17 counts of intentional damage to a protected computer, and obtaining information by computer from a protected computer. So again, as I mentioned at the outset, one of the tiers of breach notification can in fact carry criminal penalties under HIPAA as well as a lot of other related laws. So how do we mitigate risk in the era of ransomware? Well, first and foremost, ransomware is basically taking a person's data and holding it hostage in exchange for money. Ransomware can disrupt the confidentiality, integrity, and or availability of the data. There are different types of attacks, but some which have received a lot of press lately are maze, and that is a type that encrypts all files and demands ransom for the recovery of the files. It threatens to release the information onto the internet if the victim does not pay the demanded ransom. Unfortunately, in certain circumstances, the cyber criminals have already released the information onto the internet, and it's very likely that the integrity of the data that you are receiving back if you pay it is not intact. Revel is file blocking and is considered as a cyber threat that encrypts a victim's files after infecting the system and sends a request message. And RIOC ransomware mainly targets business giants and government agencies that can pay huge sums of ransoms in return. One very important item to note is that the Office of Foreign Asset Control, which falls under the U.S. Department of the Treasury, in October of 2020 issued two bulletins saying don't pay the ransom because you, the individual who is paying the ransom, do not know who is on the other side receiving the payment. And it could be going to a state actor which the United States or United States citizen is precluded from 
exchanging funds or doing business with. So that's something to bear in mind as well. FIPS are the Federal Information Processing Standards. They really go hand in hand with NIST. And I mentioned NIST early on, not only as part of a risk assessment and that crosswalk, and HHS has that up on their website, but also as part of HR 7898 and the ability to get that safe harbor. So whenever you're dealing with a cyber attack, you want to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Said a more succinct way, it is prevention, detection, and correction. So CISA ransomware guidance, basically we know what ransomware is and the best practices include maintaining offline backups, maintaining regularly updated gold images of critical systems, in the event they need to be rebuilt and maintaining a comprehensive response plan. Also inherent in best practices is updated policies and procedures and ongoing training. So the joint government agency publication, which was updated on October 29th of 2020, came about after six ransomware attacks against hospitals across the United States. And here are the two takeaways. First, the primary tactics utilized to infect systems with ransomware for financial gain were RIOC and Conti. And RIOC was the last bullet on the prior slide. And the primary activities include credential harvesting mail exfiltration, crypto mining, point of sale data exfiltration, and the deployment of ransomware. So what are some NIST tips and tactics involving ransomware? You wanna use antivirus software consistently, keep computer patches up to date, block access to ransomware sites by installing the relevant software, allow only authorized apps on computers, tablets, and smartphones, restrict personally owned devices, and if your company allows personal devices, make sure that you have a very strict BYOD policy, as well as some form of ability to wipe the phone, especially if it is being utilized for company business, but there should also be a backup of that in the event of an attack, a lawsuit, or a government investigation. Use standard user accounts versus accounts with administrative privileges wherever possible. Avoid the use of personal apps and website on company or work computers and train the workforce to be aware of unknown sources, social engineering, and be sure to run an antivirus and or look at links carefully. So before I open the floor to questions, I wanted to some our presentation of HIPAA's first 25 years and moving into its next 25 years with the following. The healthcare industry continues to be a top target of cyber criminals. The DOJ is increasingly taking action for cybersecurity attacks associated with PHI, which ties back to HIPAA and the High Tech Act, and no doubt we'll see it with the 21st Century Cures Act as well. Individual access to one's own PHI and medical records will continue to be an emphasis. However, as we saw with information blocking, it must be balanced against cybersecurity considerations, which may affect other patients and business organizations, including the practice and its business associates. And the top five actions to mitigate risk are an annual risk analysis or risk assessment, adequate policies and procedures, business associate agreements, annual workforce training, and making sure that data is encrypted both at rest and in transit. And with that, Catherine, I open the floor to any questions. 
Great. Well, that was a really wonderful overview about HIPAA and um, its anniversary and um, new things that have happened and coming up. So thank you so much. Really very much appreciate that. Um, I do have some questions. Um, how might the executive order impact the pending revisions to the privacy rule? That's a great question, in part because it calls for coordination between the government and the private sector, and that's not new. We saw that with the 21st Century Cures Act and some other initiatives where the government has collaborated with the private sector, especially in relation to security. From my perspective, the information blocking component, which is part of the 21st Century Cures Act, and as we know, that is one of the three laws that is being focused on in the proposed final privacy rule. I think we might see some tightening around the parameters, but otherwise, until we see it, I don't know how we could speculate beyond that. Right, right. Okay, um, okay, what are the five best ways to mitigate risk of non-compliance with HIPAA? So this is my favorite thing to talk about, but in all seriousness, it was the five items on the last slide, and that is conducting an annual risk assessment making sure that data is encrypted at rest and in transit, making sure that employees are adequately trained, that business associate agreements are in place, and that policies and procedures are not only adequate, but also updated as needed. Okay, all right. All right, um, this, is a, this is a good one. Um, okay. If someone has a ransomware attack, um, one, should they, should they pay it, I guess? And then what are two items that anyone should remember before paying it, before paying a ransom in the event of a ransomware attack? So that is a great question. The... Uh, first item is what I mentioned related to the Office of Foreign Asset Control. And you don't want to pay any ransom right away because of the potential liability that can come down the pike for paying an actor or a cyber criminal that you don't know who you're paying. A related part of that is that whether we look at the Let's see, whether we look at the FBI's guidance, CISA guidance, the Department of Health and Human Services guidance, or even OFAC, they all recommend contacting the FBI first. And anyone can go on the FBI's website and there is a conduit for reporting that. But it's important to coordinate with law enforcement and I've had to do that in my own practice, including when there have been situations where a international actor was involved. So two primary things are A, contact the FBI, and B, don't pay the ransom without the government's approval for doing so. Is it usual that, or is it, um, I guess is it um, not unusual um, for if there's a ransom attack uh, or rans ransomware attack for um, whoever the bad actor is on the other side. If they are, um, for if someone gets involved in this um, sticky situation, for them to, um, you know, if something is paid, for the the bad actor on the other side to then say, oh well, we forgot that this other condition, and you're going to have to pay this other part as well you know, and then up it again. As it, is that usual or um, ha, does that happen sometimes? It does, it does. Yeah. And it depends on the actor and mm -hmm. it depends on what's at stake. Right, right. 
which is the problem with paying these ransoms as well. I would exactly. Assume. Exactly. When does it end? Yeah. And that's exactly the, the contact law enforcement. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Let me ask one more question here. Um, okay. All right. How should organizations incorporate HR 7898? How should organizations incorporate 7898? The most mm -hmm. basic way to do it is during the annual risk assessment by utilizing not only the requisite items in the security rule, those specific technical, administrative, and physical CFRs, but also cross-referencing and including the NIST standards as well. By doing that, that enables an entity to make sure that they're addressing NIST and for the policies and procedures that I do for my clients, I also reference NIST and as I said, ISO and sometimes Corbett in those policies and procedures as well. Okay, all right, very good. Well, um, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up then. If anybody else has other questions, has any other questions, if you could please um, reach out to Rachel Rose directly um, and her contact information is right here. You can also, um, please recall, you can download the slides right here with a, a button on the side or the upper part of your screen. Uh, if you forget um, and have a question later, you can uh, contact us and we will forward your questions on. Uh, please remember your PACOM or your PMI CEU certificate will be emailed to you from within two days following the broadcast. There's no need to request it. And Rachel, I wanted to thank you again so much for being here today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Always fun. And I think everyone should go and get a cupcake now in order of HIPAA's birthday. I agree. I agree. So <laughs> Happy birthday, happy anniversary, HIPAA. Exactly. So, yes, exactly. <laughs> um, attendees, please remember you can register for any future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com and uh, call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us. <laughs>